Good afternoon, everyone. Did, did you guys have a good lunch? Got something to eat? Ready to listen to the last two presentations of the day? Perfect. So we have uh, the information lab with us, and they would be talking about how they are using Oratrix as almost a tool for creativity and doing all types of analysis. So I'm going to pass it on to them. Hey guys. Uh, so, they are hobbyists to, to the boardroom. Let's, uh, let's get started with some intro introductions. We're the, from the Information Lab. We're a, a partner based out of uh, London in the UK. We're an Ultrex partner as well as a Tableau partner. Tableau partner of the year um, last year. So, um, I'm Chris Love. I'm uh, a two times Grand Prix winner. Um, Ultrax Ace, <laughs> you probably know me, I've been using Ultrax for more years than I care to remember. To be honest, that number changes as often as I do to presentation. I can't remember how long I've been using it. Um, we've got Craig, Craig's with, uh, been with Tableau now for, uh, using Tableau for five years, been using Ultrax for about two, he's a, a Tableau Zen Master, a big part of the, the Tableau community. Um, we've got Tim, Tim's a Again, uh, Ultrax Tableau consultant. Um, he's been using both products for about two years. And, uh, as you'll have seen if you were in the keynote this morning, he's a uh, quantified self expert and uh, probably a, a gleaming example of, if anyone is of, of a data hobbyist. Um, so, what do we mean by data hobbyist? Well, these guys have just pulled some kind of some recognized experts from the Tableau and Ultrax community. Um, particularly on, on Twitter, and you know, these guys are held up as some of the some of the leading lights in, in Tableau and Ultrax. But let me let you into a secret: they didn't. Were, they weren't born with their skills. They didn't get there through just getting this knowledge from from nowhere. I think probably Joe is the only person, Joe Manko is probably the only person <laughs> who was born with those skills. <laughs> um, but they had to work at it, they had to learn. I had to learn, Craig, Tim, all had to learn. But you don't do that through working just with the data in your problem. You do that through working with data, outside of work, playing with it. And, and to be honest, that's how all these guys have, have kind of started working. And you might be asking, well, why isn't everyone doing that? Why haven't you all got data hobbyists within your organization? Well, there's a, there's a few reasons, and I picked out a, a few that I think are fairly key. We, we don't give access to, to tools and data, probably as much as we should. We lock down the data in our organization and stop people from accessing the data where they can get really good insights from. So, um, how many times do you have to go to IT and ask for access to a certain data set for your, your, your analysis? Um, how often are you just working with the same data set? Yeah. I, I, I often work for, with consultants, with doing consultancy, and, and you know, we don't work with the most fun data sometimes. And it's hard to get inspired by that data. It's hard to find the time, the energy to go off and do new things when you're working with the data you work with day in, day out. Um, and I think the, the Kind of last reason that perhaps we don't see as much creativity in the workplace as perhaps we should do is the fact that when you when you start looking at Ultrax, when you buy tools like Ultrax, you're often doing so to solve a particular problem. You're doing so with, with, with a given problem in mind, and you're using something like Excel, something like SAS, whatever, to do that kind of work. And it's hard work. You're manually turning that screw. And so you find Ultrax, and yeah, it becomes like the, the magic screwdriver on the right. It's doing the same job. <laughs> it's just it's just a little bit better at doing it. It's fantastic. It's great to use, but you're doing the same thing. Well, how do you get out of that? How do you start using new things? How do you find the time to do that? Well, you know, I think that being a becoming a data hobbyist and encouraging data hobbyists through your organisation is is a key way of doing that. And and let's explore just how much you're, you're kind of 
you get in the most out of those tracks. And to do this, let's, I want you all on your feet. Stand up. Come on. Let's get some energy back after lunch. <laughs> so, I'm going to run through these tools. Um, they're all tools you know in old tracks. And, and we've analysed how much we use them in the information lab for our modules. What I want you to do, if you hear a tool that you haven't used before, sit down. Okay, I'm going to go through these fairly quick. So we've got browse, select, formula, input, tool container, filter, join, action, summarise, output, union, tap, text input, macro input, macro output, sort, multi-row formula, numeric up down, transpose, radio button, Macro input, record ID, text columns, cross tab, report text, sample, drop down, append fields, XML parts. Wow, you guys. We've got some good, good guys. Right, I'll sit down, cool. That's kind of where I thought we'd about end up with just a few kind of recognized experts in the room, but the majority of you. Look at this, you're, you're using kind of the top 80% of, of these tools, but You've got this whole tail down here of missed opportunity. All the tools that you're perhaps not using as much as you could. We want to, you know, you need to get out there and, and start using this fantastic tool that you've got in Altrex that offers all this opportunity. And, and that's what we think encouraging data hobbyists within your organisation can help you bring that along and start working with, with those new tools in new and exciting ways. And what we're going to do over the course of the next six examples is just work through that and see how we've used tools, uh, how we've built things in Altrex and Tableau to encourage the use of, uh, of those and, and then apply it back to how we've how we worked in, uh, in the information lab. So let's start with Tim. Tim's going to uh, just explore a couple of use cases. Thank you. So um, I love quantified self. Uh, I track loads of things, for example, my usual resting heart rate is about 56 beats per minute, and if I check right now, it's about 110. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll show you that. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, uh, I love data, and actually, uh, when I first started using all tricks, as Chris mentioned, most of the data I was using I wasn't familiar with, I was coming up across a lot of hurdles I didn't understand, so I thought, Hey, why don't I use some of my own data? I collect a lot of it anyway. So I use Last.fm. Last.fm is a service that basically tracks what you're listening to. It connects to Spotify or iTunes, and then it just logs every time you listen to a track. So this is the module that I built, and it uses a lot of the same tools. Uh, but one of the most important things I learned through this process was actually the iterative way that all tricks works. And uh, a lot of the same tools are used here, but it boils down to basically three essential parts, and I'm going to focus in on those. Um, the first is the download tool. It's a really simple tool, but it also has the power to be uh, used by experts. It can be incredibly advanced. And all I had to do was uh, input a URL, which is partly formatted from my username, uh, API key, and then fire that to last of them, and what you get back are two data fields. The first is a data header, which is essentially schematic or meta information about the API call. And the second is your XML, structured data set, that you can obviously pass through Altrix. And to do that, I'm using the Altrix uh, XML pass tool. Again, another great, really simple tool. You point the column that has the XML data in it. You tick off a few options. In this case, I want to avoid any errors, so I pretty much picked everything. And it passes the XML. And very quickly, you can see here that I've now pulled out uh, for each user amount of pages and the total number of tracks. Now, Last.fm stores your data in pages, so you need to call uh, each page via one API call. So now I know how many tracks and how many calls I'm going to need to make. Um, now, when you're doing this process, when you're working with live data, when you're in the flow of development, you don't want to have to be running hundreds of thousands of tracks through the API calls. You can hit your API limit quickly, but it can also slow you down because you're working over the internet. So what I did was I used the detour tools in a slightly unconventional way to sort of uh, allow me to switch between development and production. So if I detour to the left, it goes through the sampling tool. It just returns one user. And I use this throughout the rest of the module just to return the first 10 tracks, for example. And if I go to the right, everything goes through. So when I'm in production, I simply switch this to the right, and we're in production. And there's a question here. 
switch. Okay. Yeah, so there's a configuration option in the detour start tool, which is simply a checkbox. And you can also manipulate that using a macro or as a like an action. So you can, you can manipulate that. Um, and so this this allows me to switch between workflows. I don't have to redo my my all tricks module to, to meet different purposes. And then Essentially, that brings me to this point. This is essentially where I started. I, I keep iterating through, and this was the first sort of bunch of data I got. After subsequent API calls, I kept on going back to the last of them, pivoting data, passing data, maybe going to Wikipedia, and through all tricks, I end up uh, starting with something like this, and I end up with something like that. Lots more questions I can ask, lots more uh, answers I can get from that. And that allows me to produce a visualization like this. At the moment, this is a static screenshot of Tracy Chapman. You can tell that in 2009, I had a massive discovery. Uh, it was absolutely brilliant. I don't know what happened a few years after, but I rediscovered it last year. Um, <laughs> you can also notice I've pulled in information from Wikipedia on the left-hand side. That's actually just a string. I happen to realize that if you just put in the artist name, Wikipedia automatically um, generates your page. So there you go. It looks like it's part of my dashboard, but I didn't do much. But the core cool section here is actually where I listen to music. I needed another data set to do this. And this is what took me to the next level of the development of this. And it moves me nicely on to the next part of the talk, which I'm going to start talking about and moves now. But before we move on to that, just to reiterate, the key thing about this first sort of learning lesson was iterative thinking, being able to develop and constantly keep changing the way things are working for me. So let's look at moves. Um, how many of you have heard of Moves? Moves app? Okay, great. So for those of you who haven't, it's an app that sits on your phone and it does what your phone does anyway, which is track what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> in this particular case, uh, track exactly where you are. Uh, the only difference is this app surfaces that information for you. I can actually access this information and use it for my own benefit. It's not a good idea. So uh, you, get a, you get a timeline here on the left hand side of where you've been, and I actually have that for the last two years. <laughs> I have about 97% coverage. The other 3% is when my phone battery dies up. So <laughs> um, you can get the data in two ways. Data export or using the last of them API. Data export gives you a whole host of files, but we like using all tricks natively. So Craig actually built a macro which talks directly to the Moves API, and we can get our data out that way. And so we actually turned this, what started off as a, a hobbyist sort of activity into something that can actually solve a real business problem. We wanted to figure out uh, where are we spending time with our clients. And some of us use Moves, so maybe if we know the addresses of our clients and we're all using Moves, we can use some tools and all tricks to help us solve that problem. We use a cloud-based accounting system, it's called FreeAgent, and uh, we've also got a macro which pulls information from that. And we put our uh, Moves data up on SQL Server so we can talk to it more flexibly. And uh, we use this Find Nearest tool. Uh, if any of you have been to the uh, spatial analytics sessions, you'll know a lot about this tool. But it's a really quite a simple tool. You've got two inputs, targets, which are essentially your GPS points that Moves generates, and universe. I think of these as geofences or geo buckets, where something falls within the zone and it gets tagged with that universe. Um, and that enables us to essentially match uh, our movements with our clients. And so, as you can see, I spend most of my time with Unilever, uh, nearly over 100 and something days there, and as you can see, you start to get some interesting questions, but I also want to start some more questions. For example, when I visit a client, how long on average do I spend in a given day? And it turns out the graph is very different. I like to spend more time with some of these other clients. So you can start to answer um, really interesting questions about uh, where you're spending time, but the most important thing is we've turned what was a hobbyist activity into answering business questions. And now I'm going to hand over to Chris, who's going to talk a bit more about doing that. So, Tim, Tim's talked about personal data. I want to talk a little bit more about kind of how we then can apply that back into a business environment, particularly when we start seeing new tools. Um, I remember when the segmentation tools, the k-means clustering tools, came out in, in Optrex. I needed a, a good way of learning these tools. I needed to practice before I went out to our clients and started using these in day-to-day -day work. And so I turned to one of my favorite pursuits, which was whiskey. I uh, 
I enjoy a, a nice glass of scotch, so uh, I, I thought, well, what, what better way of in, kind of investigating this segmentation tool than building out a, a clustering algorithm which told me which clusters different scotches were in, which flavours of scotch are, are well suited together, which groups do they naturally fall in through the smell, through the taste, through the finishing in the back of your throat, and how do they cluster together? And so I, I produced this Tableau dashboard. The key underlying to, to this data was the, um, was the whiskey data that I was able to download. Now, I went on Google, found, found the data that, uh, that I needed very easily. It was just a quick kind of whiskey data. There it was. <laughs> now, my challenge to you is, if you want to encourage data hobbyists in your organization, make date finding data within your organization as easy as this. Because if I can go away and explore whiskey data just as easy as this and produce some great visualizations, you don't know who in your organization is going to be able to do that for you if they can just find data like that and get some, get some really interesting uh, output out of it. So I took the data, it just had ones and zeros describing the, the flavors that you can get out of uh, each whiskey, the smells, etc. And that puts it into a module. Now, there's a few interesting aspects. Most of this is the, the kind of top 20% of tools we've already talked about, but let's focus on those kind of, uh, those, those new tools. The, first of all, the, the nearest neighbor analysis. So the nearest neighbor looks at the distances between different data sets um, and, and finds the, the points within that data. So the, in this case, the whiskies, that it could be customers, it could be stores, that, are nearest each other in terms of the parameters that you feed into that tool. So I fed in the different flavors of whiskey, and it told me which characteristics, which, which whiskey is shared the nearest characteristics, which then told me perhaps which nearest whiskey I should then move on to if I enjoy a, a given one. And so that's got great use within your, your business environment in terms of building that benchmarking, similarity score, and things like that. Another part of, of using building this visualization was the clustering, which I've already talked about. So grouping whiskies into, into similar groups of, uh, of flavors, so that if I enjoy, I know that if I enjoy a very sweet, dry whiskey, then I can go into, into a certain group and pick whiskies from, from a given area. And so the, the, two, uh, the two kind of components of that are the analyzed clusters and then uh, scoring those out using the append clusters. And again, I've, I've since worked through through this with, with certain uh, clients of ours, building out the same thing using customers' stores, looking at how to, how they can take a set of customers and batch them into buckets to be able to treat those customers very very in, in similar ways to get the, the analysis that uh, that they need to get out. So this I was able to do that and it worked very well. But one of the key things in being able to present this visualization was moving on to kind of making it pretty, make, making the field names nice. So now if you've not used this at all, I, I, I recommend you do the dynamic rename tool. Um, it will literally change your life. You can just feed in new data through the right um, input, really useful after the predictive tools which will rename those uh, properties and, and create your uh, new field names and, and, and set those headers automatically based on the data that's fed through. And so bringing all these tools together, I was able to then practice doing all this in a nice, safe environment, building my own data and create something that then people would critique. It was with data I knew, it was with skill, I was very familiar with it. And then take this into a, an environment that I was unfamiliar with and apply the same rules. So using my data obvious skills, I was then able to go out and, and produce the, some useful analysis for our clients. So, um, kind of working in a, in a very safe environment. Uh, let me hand over to Craig now, who's going to take you through these uh, last few examples. Thanks, Craig. This one working okay? Yeah? Yeah, let's swap over, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, these last three we're going to go through, and, and the, the first two are sort of uh, really starting to progress us into how we took what we learned using the, the tools that have been highlighted already and put them into one final um, module, one final macro that has actually become the cornerstone of, of how we operate as a company. Let's do the, the first one. So, 
I have a bit of a, a, an interest in um, planes that seem to go overhead. And you know, I've done the, the thing that everyone does, they have relatives going off on holiday, and for some reason you have this need to go on a website like Flight Radar 24, or in this case, Plane Finder, and, and watch their journey. <laughs> Such an exciting day. <laughs> So these guys, uh, except the thing that actually really excites me about these kind of services, it's one of the most unknown, but I think biggest open data communities worldwide. If anyone doesn't know, when a, a plane is flying, it's constantly um, broadcasting its latitude, longitude, where it is. And there, there are people around the world who stick a, an aerial on top of their roof, and it captures these beacons that are being sent out and they, it comes through the internet, all gets brought together, and allows websites like this to function. The weird thing is, these websites know more about where planes are in the world than the people who operate the planes. <laughs> there isn't, there aren't any houses in the Indian Ocean with areas on the top. It's sort of on the floors. Anyway, <laughs> so, I thought, well, I, I want to try and capture this information. I use the website, but you know, I want to play with it. So I'm doing an Altrix, put it to Tableau, do some mapping. And so we have some friends at uh, EasyJet, a great client of ours, and they gave me access to um, Plane Finder's API. And I produced this module, and it's kind of got two parts to it. So the way the, the Plane Finder API works is you ping it once, and it'll tell you all the flights that are in the air at that time. Okay? And you ping it again. And the, flight, the planes will have moved a little bit, but you just get at that point in time where the flights are. And that's what the top half is doing. You can see the download tool and the extra parts that Tim had added earlier. And they get stored, but then obviously you want to build up a big data set. You don't just want like one second's worth of information. So it's then appended and, and, and unioned onto the previous results to give me one so holistic data set I can start uh, analyzing. Now, the problem with this comes, and the thing I learned very quickly, is there are over 3,000 planes in the air at any one time on average. And if I'm calling an API every minute, that's going to generate 4.2 million records every day. I want to do this constantly, probably for a month, a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and every single day, it's going to generate about a quarter of a gig of data in a YXDB. So it compresses it. It's a lot of information. So a great tip that I kind of want to the highlight of this helped me learn is that, um, uh, and sort of perfect was splitting out. If you're recording live data, if you're if you're you've got a, this this data problem, um, split out into the data for that day. Okay, so it's really simple addition, no weird tool, but just a, a, a formula tool given the, the date of today, and then slightly adjusting the uh, output tool to replace the file name with the date. So every single day, a new file is generated, and you can start archiving all the previous stuff, or maybe you have another process to get it into a, into a database, or maybe some um, Hadoop cluster, as we saw, saw in the, the keynote this morning. That has a problem, though, because think about what's going to happen tonight. We're going to cross over from midnight to the next day, and the day the file name is going to change for pending new records to. So, Another great tool that's kind of um, it, it's used very little is a dynamic input tool. And what this means is I can, again, put the data today into the dynamic input tool, and it's going to adjust the, the, the data it's pulling in, the file name, in order to append that day's data. However, it does have an issue where if there is no file present, it, it, it'll error. So when we do cross over from midnight plus one minute, it's going to error out, it's not going to find the file for that day, it just doesn't exist. So, again, something uh, hidden away in the, the, the formula tool, it's not immediately obvious, is a uh, function about does the file exist or not? And then apply a bit of uh, logic to that, say, well, if it doesn't exist, use it, obviously. If it doesn't exist, pull in a blank YXDB, which has all the columns in it that I need, but no data in it. So it's always valid, this module's always going to work, and every day it's just going to tick over, generating more and more data, and all I have to do is occasionally archive some stuff on this module. So that produces this. Uh, and there is actually a bit more um, uh, in this good article. Maybe if we've got time later on, we can refresh it and, uh, and have a look at the, the latest slides. But it's kind of interesting just capturing where people have flown from, from uh, to, to get to Inspire.
So what I learned from, from that, it, it, it was really my sort of um, moment where I thought, look, this is, this is a real kind of hobbyist thing in, in flights, and, and one that a guy I worked with uh, a few months ago was really into it a lot. And when you really sort of moved it into a commercial sense, you actually have um, the guys at EasyJet sometimes emailing us saying, we want to know a bit more about this flight, do you have the data on it? And they're capturing it themselves to try and figure out, well, if, if we think a plane is going to fly one way, but the pilots are constantly going a slightly different way, and it's a bit shorter, we don't have to put as much fuel on that plane. So we can save money. If you can think for a, a low-cost airline, it's a pretty big deal if you can save a few gallons of fuel on every single flight that goes out. So the next one we're going we're gonna to move to is, and actually we're going to go more into the, the, the business end now. And it's a tool we use called, um, called SmartShare. And for anyone who hasn't found it, it's, a, it's part of this sort of uh, social media advocacy um, tool set that they're out there to help get your employees sort of onto Facebook, get them. Uh, is this really good? Is it just one? It's fine. Just try. Um, so, SmartShare encourages uh, the employees within the organization to post interesting content that we create um, out into their, their, their Twitter accounts, their Facebook accounts, um, or, or uh, LinkedIn. And we get data from it, you know, like any kind of website, uh, any service like this, you get some information back. You know, you click that report button and you get a table. Not even a sorted table, just a random table. And, and so I can't, you know, you, you do this stuff in order to make better decisions to try and maybe find better content to use um, or to help encourage people to, to, to do the sharing, to get to engage with the community. And I can't really make decisions on this. What I did find though, through um, pressing a couple of buttons in Chrome and looking at uh, what's going on in the background is, this site is actually, it's an application that runs locally. And again, it contains an API to get the data from the server. Anyone's interested in how to do that? F12 in uh, Google Chrome gives you all the information you can possibly need. So I found that API call, I looked at what it was doing, and I packed it and put it into objects. So it created a module like this. So what this is going to do is go up to that API the same way that table does and grab the data for me. But instead of just getting me sort of a month's worth of data that that, that table did, it's going to get the data that the sharing for every single day. The, that we've been using the tool. And so I wanted to highlight this, this Generate Rose tool. All right, it's great if you need to drive API calls across um, either a number of record IDs or, or in this case from the first day that we started using the tool, creating a new record for every single day generates a brand new call to that API. And so, you know, making it dynamic by saying, is it less than or equal to today, means that this thing's just going to keep generating rows and rows of calls and just um, getting all the data that I need. It comes back as JSON, I thought, well, we've done XML parsing, so I should highlight JSON parsing as well. Um, if you find that your data comes back from the download tool with curly brackets on it, probably JSON. And the JSON parse tool is, is great, and I, I actually used Ultrix before it was around, and now I, I love it. It's, it's uh, been a fantastic addition. What it does when you, get, when you run the data through is you get a big, long table of data, okay, with two columns, one's a header and one's a value. And so there's a, a, a companion tool with JSON parse that saves you so much time. It's, it's simply the text to columns tool. And in JSON parse, everything's separated by a full stop, a, a, a dot, and you can separate out, in this case, the record ID from each row and the header name, and then we can do some work to, to make that tool available later on. What I also find with JSON data is it tends to be organized where you have kind of meta information at the top of the record, and then all the values and everything below that. And so if you find your data is coming through like that and you want to take that meta information and apply it to all of the rows below it, look into the multi-row formula tool. Absolutely fantastic for this. It runs through all of the, the table that we have here. If it finds that row that says it's a, it's a header, it's um, a, a new name, it just grabs that value puts it into a brand new column. If it doesn't find the name, it just repeats what's above it. So we end up with a nice big long list of um, everyone's name dependent to their record, and then we go and pivot that out so we can, uh, we can do a search and a sort on, on those users. So this one every day publishes um, to my tablet server, and so I get a visualization that's like this. 
the loads more um, information I can get out of this. I can see quite clearly that you know everyone thinks that Twitter is the thing to, to be using, but actually gets so much more reach with LinkedIn. And we have some employees um, who, who just seem to get a lot more than others, so maybe encourage them to use LinkedIn uh, specifically as their, their tool. Um, we have others have a, a great reach on, on Twitter, but funny enough, Facebook, it doesn't, people just don't share their business stuff through Facebook. We do gamify it a bit, and they get so many more points for using Facebook, but people just don't want to spam their friends with, with, with business content. Yeah. But we get to see sort of how this is trending through time, and are we beating the previous months, and are we doing more and more? Yes? Uh, what is the input going into the terrible focus? Okay, so maybe we can, um, I can show this one a bit more, a bit more later. Um, but essentially it's just we've got the, the, the phone, it's a, it has two tools. One logs into the server, and then the other one publishes the data up. It's just separate out. Okay. So, smart share. We had a boring table, it gave me nothing. I broke it a little bit by breaking free, and now I get, um, the information that I need to, to use that tool better. And funny enough, it makes me want to renew the license for the tool. <laughs> so finally, we're going to move into what is kind of the cornerstone for a, a software license resell, uh, and that is our support desk. For the information lab, we really take our support desk very seriously. Okay, it's not a, a sort of generic uh, portal you go into, it's specifically designed to, to look like our website, to be very friendly and, and, and recognizable. Internally, we have targets to, to give our customers the best, um, the best support we can. We don't just say that you know the, we'll get back to you within a day or something. We say we should get back to you within an hour. Internally, we try and say every 10 minutes is a target. We try and solve problems within a day. We don't necessarily have like three or five days. Really trying and so when it's this important, the report better be good, right? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Same problem. Okay. We get numbers out which have little arrows on them to say whether it's gone up or down. Okay. And I get some percentages of where the ticket came from and, and you know I love donuts, but they're <laughs> just <laughs> um, the donuts read, I hate it. Um, but these guys actually do have a published API that we can use. Okay, so we're going to take everything that we've learned so far from connecting with Moves, with, with Last FM, getting flights, getting um, the, the social media stuff, and put it to use with actually a really complex problem. We're going to see the, the module that runs again every day, pulling in and uh, every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, pulling in latest information about our support desk, putting it into a SQL server which we then um, interrogate and, and analyze and in order to make the company better, in order to better serve our, our customers. I'm not gonna highlight any tools in this really, I'm just gonna sort of go through the, the method because really everything is what we've seen so far. When we go to get all the support tickets, there was one immediate challenge, and that is paging. So APIs try and limit how much you call them by uh, and how much sort of load you put on the servers by returning, say, 50 tickets with a call. Now, Alteryx make it super easy to say, screw that, you know, we're gonna get everything. Um, it's called an iterative macro, and it allows you to do paging. Uh, and the method goes like this. You <coughs> count how many records have been returned by the call. If you received what is a full page, so let's say it was a 50 record limit, and we get 50 records that come through, then, we go up to uh, what's called the, the iterative output. All right, and all this does is increase the page number and send the URL back, and it goes all the way back from the output back to the input and runs the whole thing again. If we don't get uh, a full page of data, we assume that it's finished and the, it, it comes out as false through that filter. No data goes through the top, so it, doesn't, it knows not to go back around the iterative loop and it just outputs all the remaining results down the bottom to give us our full list of tickets. Once we've got all those tickets though, we need to figure out what's going on. Now a support desk is actually really quite a complex beast. It not only just, just want the number of tickets, but you want to know all the activity that happened within that ticket. 
you want to know from the first um, request that came through how long it took anyone to get to do that initial response. From that, you want to know when the, the ticket went from um, just being open to being kind of to being pending to being sort of we think it's solved. Whether it was opened again or not because it wasn't solved, or whether it was then immediately resolved and closed. So we pull it all apart and, and get all the activity. And again, similar stuff that we've seen so far. We grab the ticket, it comes down in JSON, it gets parsed out. It then gets trans uh, transformed and, and pivoted to make it into to transaction data, exactly the same way that I just showed you with the, with the smart chip. We then calculate timings, so all this complexity about, well, you know, the difference in time between uh, the ticket being active, being paused, how long in total duration, how long should we actually be doing something on it. And then finally generating some, some KPIs to um, help us draw the dashboards and get the information out. And one final thing, um, we are not a 24-hour company. We're trying to, you know, we'd love to take over the world and be all the way around, but we're not there yet. We're getting there. Um, so our system operates, you know, the, the support desk is like open from 8 till, uh, 8 till 5. And the thing we don't want to do is, um, I don't want to be calling someone up saying, wait a minute, you were responsible for the desk that day, um, and you didn't answer a ticket for like five hours. And they come back to me and go, yeah, it's because we were logged at 7 a.m. You know, I mean, 2 a.m. Maybe we have a really avid tablet user who just, you know, really loves to, to stay up late and, uh, and be using software. So we calculate, you know, working hours. Uh, and again, um, this uses a, a generate rows tool, we generate every possible minute for the, um, in a day, and then we tag all of the activity that goes on to that, that minute, compress it down, and it helps us figure out exactly how many active minutes there were, and how many open minutes, and how many closed minutes. All of that results in this. And this is, there's, there's more tabs to this, there's about uh, a, a four or five time dashboard, but just immediately, I get this every day, telling me, Know how well this is doing. You can see right at the start, there's some orange in, the, in that box at the top, uh, top right there. Okay, we're still figuring it out. We're still figuring how to make the process better. But those boxes are getting better and better and better. And now it's got to a point where we love um, our support desk so much, and we found that we just got so much out of it and improved the system so much, we just send clients or prospects the, the dashboard. Someone asks me, well, what your SLA is? Everyone says four hours in response. Everyone says three days, five days for closure. I send them a bar chart that says we answer it within 15 minutes on average. It's perfect. It's a cornerstone to the company now. So a business result from previous five, where we just played around, made ourselves better, helped us learn and alter it. And ultimately, trying to change this from being just data hobbyists and into Jedi hours. <laughs> What I would say to you, this is the call to action, allow people to do it. Just like Chris was saying at the start, give them an hour on a morning, give them two hours a week, give them something, just to play around with the tool. Okay? Encourage them to just you know, spend some time over lunch with a group of people who've got a few licenses, and just play around with something that interests them. It doesn't matter whether you use it, what they learn will just skyrocket their, their durability. And um, when you do ask them to come to your With that, are there any questions? Yes? Move down to a website um, during limitations on it, or you're beginning where you're pulling all the data on board with it. If you go too far, or you're going know, like, to crash the server, or you have issues with that. So the question was, um, pulling data from a website, are you going to start hitting sort of uh, limit problems, are you loading the site too much, what's going to happen? Um, in theory, yes, you could. Most websites now have um, limits on them, and Altrix has a rate limiter tool that recently came in, I think with 9.5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Tim was big, uh, wanting that a lot. Uh, yeah. And it allows you to slow down and say that you should only make like 10 calls a minute or something. Um, uh, I, uh, have been blocked quite a few times from, you know, with my IP address. Uh, I've got the knack down of generating new servers, getting your IP addresses to make websites again, uh, just to get a demo on. Something important. Uh, but yeah, if you can hit problems, most websites will sort of block you and you end up getting there on your download tool. Uh, but using that really is a great solution.
actually I learned fuzzy matching from your YouTube video. Uh, so um, I was wondering if you have any good resources for people who aren't familiar with API calls, um, or I can maybe give references on some uh, material that someone can learn how to handle those kind of calls. Okay, so the question was, you know, how, how do you uh, get into API calls and uh, any good sort of reference material? Um, I think I, I, we got a little bit lucky. One of the um, solutions we did use it has a really well documented API. Um, as a company, we have all of our systems out in the cloud. We don't have any on-premise stuff. Um, so it kind of became a, it was kind of a requirement to just do it up front. Um, I wouldn't start with like, you know, you might think, oh, I'll try Twitter. Uh, don't do that. Twitter is an awful API. It's so complex to do the open authentication. Uh, yeah, anything that has open authentication just adds complexity. Um, so if you've just got something that is either an open API, uh, get rid of the authentication piece, or if that's simply using a password, um, it's, a, it's a good way to start. But yeah, you look for something that's got good authentication. Okay, one was I've seen Quandle is on Yes, it's a fantastic that's right. Yeah, Quandle is a, uh, this sort of open repository of data uh, covering everything from uh, financial information to World Health stats on there as well. And it's a great way to, to get started. Um, following up on that, you mentioned earlier F12 and Chrome. <coughs> I think that uh, my journey along the way of, uh, I've, I've, I've done a lot of these things too, where I either want to go download whatever, um, but I also wanted to plug Fiddler as another great web yeah, traffic, as an online stuff open source tool uh, that is free to download. and. I would just suggest to anybody who wants to be doing this, um, go to any type of web website where you can type in your uh, zip code and let's say get the closest McDonald's or something like that, or the weather in your area, or whatever, you know, any of the tools that these guys have talked about too. Open up F12 in either Chrome or IE, most of them F12 gives you the little <coughs> developer window at the bottom, and you can see the web traffic that goes through. And I learned so much by just looking at it and being like, oh, here's the call that, that loads the web page, but here is this other call that act actually talks directly to the web server. And that one, I can take that little bit and use. And, and a lot of these things leverage off of the, the secondary call, not loading the big page. So just another tip of like learning it, teaching yourself is just watching the feed that goes through when you're uh, requesting data. I'm getting people away from me, so I think we're just about out of time. Uh, thank you so much for your attention.